excited to have you here again tonight. Uh, those of you that are joining us on Facebook Live, um, I hope you did not miss last Wednesday night um, because it was such a blessing. Uh, Dr. Terry Trammell is our guest uh, via video and he is teaching us on end time prophecy and it is entitled, What Will the End Be? And tonight our focus is going to be on the tribulation period. Uh, last week he talked to us about the rapture of the church. So those of you that were not able to be with us last Wednesday night, if you will go to our webpage, you can view last Wednesday night's service there. I promise you, you want to catch up if you did not have an opportunity. Uh, he has declared unto us that there's nothing that has to happen before Jesus comes back. It will be worth your time to go and watch that. 
Tonight, we are going to be focused on being courageous in the crisis. And uh, what will the end be? And I'm without further ado, I want to turn it over to Dr. Tam Trammell, and I want him to have ample time tonight. I think this is going to run about 40 minutes. But I do want to read one verse of Scripture to you tonight. Um, because the Word of God declares to us in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, But of that day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And I just want to say to you tonight that no man, not one, knows when Jesus is coming back. He himself does not even know. But the Father is going to say, go get my children. I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. You can be ready. And we just encourage you tonight to focus on that as you're listening to what tribulation period is going to look like and what it's going to be. We want to turn this over to Dr. Trammell at this time. And I just want you, I, I encourage you, if you've got questions, uh, just take you out a piece of paper, write those things down, and in due season we'll get those things answered for you. Um, and uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. Without further ado, we just want to let Dr. Trammell speak to us tonight. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. In the crisis, hope in a world that is filled with hurt, comfort in the midst of chaos, peace in the midst of this pandemic. What shall the end be? Hello, I'm Terry Trammell. Welcome back to our Bible study, the second session of our study through the book of Revelation on end time events that we're calling What Shall the End Be? I hope you were able to watch the first session where we talked about the rapture of the church, the next great event on God's calendar. If you didn't see that one and now you're watching this one, you do understand what happened. You missed hearing about the rapture, so you're going to hear about the tribulation. Well, I, I think we're in for a wonderful study together as we uh, look at what most of the book of Revelation is talking about. Now, before I get to chapter 6, where the tribulation events uh, unfold, I, I wanted to rehearse in your hearing just for a moment the scene from chapter 5. Again, this is a scene in heaven. We believe we, we ended last uh, uh, the last session talking about we don't know when the rapture is going to be, but personally, I believe it's going to happen before the thousand-year kingdom, before great tribulation. We said it's imminent. And then we said that, that there's a preview picture of it, perhaps in chapter 4, where John was caught up into heaven, and he joined the saints in casting their crowns uh, before the throne. In chapter 5, John sees a seven-sealed book. And no one is found worthy or able to open the book. And all of heaven is weeping. And John himself weeps because no one is found able to open this volume. Now we don't know exactly all that this book represents. Many scholars believe it is some reference to the title deed of the earth. And however you see that, that's, that, that's fine. But I, I know one thing this book represents. It's the rest of the revelation. If those seals don't get lit, uh, lifted and loose, then these events don't happen and Christ never comes back to the earth. So as John was weeping, all of a sudden, one of the elders said to him, Weep not, John, for the lion which is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And we know who that lion from the tribe of Judah is. Because our Lord Jesus Christ came not only through the lineage of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but through Judah. And, and we, we get a, a wonderful picture when he took the book. John sees him not just as the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he sees him as the lamb. What does that have to do with my life, you might be saying? Well, I, I believe it, it really means this. You ought to be able to sleep well tonight 
You don't have to toss and turn and worry and wonder what's going to happen. The future is in the hands of the Lamb. I know in the midst of this pandemic, I, I am filming this in the first week of May of 2020. I, I know that it looks like somebody has taken us into an amusement park and they put us on a roller coaster and turned it on and then they left the park and we can't get off. And that's the way we feel. But then we see this scene in heaven and the future is in the hands of the Lamb of God. And that's why you can have peace in the middle of the pandemic. You can have hope in the midst of heartache, and you can have comfort in the midst of this chaos. Now, let me go into the book of Revelation, and we're covering a lot in this session, so I'm going to have to move fairly quickly just to hit the highlights, and I hope you'll have time to go back and read the missing pieces that we were not able to cover. In chapter 6 of Revelation, there are seven seals. And every time one of them is open, another judgment comes to the earth. In chapter 8 and 9, there are seven trumpets. And every time one of them blows, there's another judgment that comes to the earth. And then in chapter 16, there's seven vials or bowls of wrath. And, and uh, each time one of them is poured out, another severe judgment comes to the earth. And you can make a case, I think, that the trumpet judgments are more severe than the seals and the vile judgments are more severe than the trumpets. And what this is telling us is that things are not going to get easier the deeper that humanity goes into this future tribulation, but they're indeed going to get worse and worse. Thus, the uh, title for our, our study in this session that things are going to get worse before they get better. So I want to start by taking you to Revelation 6, 1 through 8. And here we have those first four seals that are open. You Bible students of prophecy will recognize when I describe them as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. John sees a white horse. He sees a red horse. He sees a black horse. And he sees a pale horse. Notice they are not called the four turtles of the apocalypse. If John would have seen four turtles, he would be telling us these things are going to slowly come upon the earth. But when he said horses, it implies they're going to rapidly come upon the earth. I believe when the catching away of the saints takes place, this world is going to be ripe for judgment. Now, the, right, the white horse rider, the first one, is the most difficult really to uh, ascertain who John is seeing here. Many scholars are divided. The best evidence from my vantage point is that this picture is a rise of deception that is going to come upon the earth when the church is caught away. You see, Jesus comes back from heaven on a white horse in chapter 19, but this writer appears to be an imposter. He appear, uh, appears to be a deceiver. And the reason I lean towards the idea of deception, if you take Matthew 24 and Revelation 6, open them up side by side on your desktop, and they, they read for several verses almost exactly the same. In Matthew 24, the disciples of Jesus said, When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? and the end of the age. And the very first thing that Jesus said to answer their, their question, uh, he said there would be false Christ and false prophets. And then he went on to say nation would rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there would be famines. So it appears deception is going to be rampant. If you think things are bad now, if you think there's many false prophets and false teaching today, what will it be like when the true saints are gone? I would uh, submit to you that the second horse rider is a, a black horse um, or a red horse, which is war, and wherever war goes, famine follows, which is the black horse. And much of the world that we're living in right now is experiencing famine millions and multiplied millions going to bed hungry every night even before this pandemic. When it gets to the fourth seal, John saw a fourth 
horse, and this was a pale horse, and his name was Death, and he said, Hell followed with him. And to that rider was given power over a fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with the beasts of the field and with plagues. Now, people ask from time to time, do you think that this pandemic, this COVID-19 virus, is this a fulfillment of biblical prophecy? I personally do not believe that it is. Because I remind you, we've got to keep the future in the future. Um, things in chapter 6 are not happening specifically, even right now, because this tribulation time has not yet begun. What this pandemic, though, does show us, how rapidly that something like this could emerge on the earth, and whether it's a fourth part of the earth numerically, that would take out a couple of billion people, or if it's talking about geographically over a fourth part of the earth, we can now all see firsthand how multiplied millions of people could die at the hands of something like a plague or a disease. This whole episode uh, uh, reminds us of, uh, it's been a wake up call for us to see how some things could be fulfilled. One of the questions I've been asked in, in my teaching ministry for years, where is America that is, you know, in Bible prophecy? Where is America in the book of Revelation? And from my vantage point, I do not see America anywhere mentioned specifically. And this has always been a great uh, mystery. How could one of the superpowers, a nation that is so strong seemingly above all others, how could they not even be mentioned in Bible times? But I think we've seen many, many things in, in the last couple of decades. <clears throat> we are not near as strong of a nation as we was, as we were even before 9-11. This pandemic has shown us how that in just a few weeks, the economies as great as they are in any nation can be brought down to worthlessness and all of this is shaping up. All of this is a reminder. Things are going to get worse before they get better. Now, when John got to the fifth seal, he saw something interesting. All of a sudden, he sees in heaven an altar and souls under the altar. They have been put to death. They've been martyred. And they're crying out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you not judge and avenge our blood of them which are upon the earth. This is the first group that we might call tribulation saints. How do we know that, that they were murdered during the tribulation? Whoever put them to death, they are still alive. Their, their, uh, their predators, their perpetrators are still alive when they're calling out for vengeance. If they would have been ready to meet the Lord, they would have gone with Him. They come to believe on Christ as Savior after the rapture of the church. Now, some have mistakenly taught through the years that uh, no one would be saved. If you miss the rapture, there would be no possibility for salvation. And sometimes they, that's been based on a misunderstanding of a passage in 2 Thessalonians 2 that talked about only he who now lets or hinders till he be taken out of the way and then shall that wicked man of sin be revealed. In other words, some have thought that was a picture of the Holy Spirit. But how can anybody be saved if the Holy Spirit doesn't draw them? So the Holy Spirit is never going to be taken out of the earth. He's always been here and He still will be moving upon people. You say, well, how can anybody believe on Christ if all the true uh, servants of God are gone and the preachers and the witnesses are gone? The Lord has always had a people. When you go to Revelation 7, we are told about the 144,000 Jews. Have you heard about the 144,000? From 12,000 of them, from 12 different tribes of Israel. Evidently, these are going to be actual Jewish converts to Christ. They will have a global evangelistic ministry. And as a result of their, their ministry... We are told at the end of chapter 7 that John saw a great multitude in heaven. They were from every nation and kindred and tribe and people and tongue. 
And they were singing salvation to our God who sits on the throne and under the Lamb forever and forever. John said, who are these? And, and uh, someone asked, and John said, you know. And the answer came back, these are they who have come out of great tribulation and washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. You have to love a God that even in the midst of pouring out judgment on an unbelieving world, He will still bend His, his ear to hear the cry of whosoever will that they might be saved. Now that brings me to a question, if you'd allow me to just shift gears for a moment. How long will this tribulation period last? In between this rapture event and the time that Christ returns to the earth. The answer that most of us would give and most of us have heard in our lives growing up is seven years. And I think that's a good answer. It's a true answer, but I can modify it and make it more accurate I would say at least seven years. Make no mistake about it, there will be a seven year period that will conclude this present age. But the event that starts the last seven years is not the rapture event. You can't say, well, if Jesus comes, then seven years from that moment, then, then the tribulation will be over. No, the event that starts the last seven years is the signing of a covenant or a treaty between a coming world ruler that we know of as the Antichrist and the children of Israel. You can read about this in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Really, we need, you know, as much time to study Daniel as to do Revelation to see how it harmonizes and how it all fits. But in this, this famous passage where I just told you the location is given maybe the single most significant prophecy in the Old Testament, the prophecy of 70 weeks. 70 weeks were determined upon the nation of Israel. But they're not weeks of days like we have seven days in our week, but they're weeks of years. And seven years equal one week. And so 490 actual years were specifically prophesied for the nation of Israel. It was going to begin, according to that text in Daniel, with a decree to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, and it continued until Messiah was cut off. That is, until Jesus came and He was crucified. And when He was crucified, the clock in essence stopped. God's divine prophetic clock, and there were seven years still on that clock. The, the way that I've tried to explain it through the years, I've asked questions to uh, ladies especially, and if their husbands or sons or grandsons are uh, sports fans, I, I say, have you ever wondered why? When they're watching a game, you don't care anything about it, and the announcer says there's only two minutes left in the game, but it takes 30 minutes to play the last two minutes. Yeah. What? Oh, oh, oh. What's happening there? And the answer is very simple. There's regular time, and then there's the game time. And every time the whistle blows, the clock stops. And if you can get a picture in your mind of a great scoreboard in heaven, and when, when, when Jesus died, the clock stopped. God blew the whistle on the prophetic time clock for Israel. And there's seven years left still on the clock. But there's going to come a time in the, in the future, it may be in the near future, if we're as close to the end as we think is possible, when this coming ruler is going to negotiate a treaty, undoubtedly, between Israel and the Palestinian uh, people that they've been fighting about for centuries, he's going to bring about temporary peace. When that treaty signed and the clock starts to tick, seven years will go down, and when it does, Jesus will be here on the earth. Now, when that treaty is signed, all of a sudden, the clock is ticking. The Lord is going to send two witnesses who will be ministers for Him during this tribulation. You can read about this in Revelation chapter 11. We don't know who the two witnesses are. Many believe Elijah has to be one of them. The Scriptures seem to indicate he would come back at the end times. 
And the other one, almost equally divided among scholars, is the view that it's either Moses or it's Enoch. Some people would say it has to be Enoch because Elijah and Enoch are the only two that have not died. And since it's appointed unto man once to die, uh, they both would have to come back and die. But uh, on the other hand, that was never God's uh, appointment that man should die. And we do know that uh, the, uh, the church who is going to be alive and remain when Christ comes, they're going to be translated without dying. On the other hand, Christ has to be the first fruits of the, of the resurrection. He had to be the first one to live and then uh, to die and then to be raised to immortality. Some people then think it was Moses. And uh, Moses had an end time ministry. He confronted Pharaoh like Elijah confronted Ahab, like um, these two witnesses are going to confront this future world ruler. He had a signs and wonders uh, ministry with the plagues that's similar to what Revelation describes. I guess I'm saying I don't really know who it's going to be. What's important is not who the two witnesses are, but rather what they are and what their ministry is going to be. And we believe that you, you can read about one of the first diabolical things that the Antichrist is going to do in the middle of the last seven years. He's going to put them to death. They're going to prophesy the first three and a half years. He will kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the streets of Jerusalem. For three days, the world will see it and rejoice and send gifts to each other. And the leaders will not allow them to be buried. Now listen, our fathers and their fathers and their fathers preached and taught these things. They were going to literally come about. I have books in my library written in the 1800s and the early 1900s. And these authors were describing that this was actually going to happen. But they were ridiculed and made fun of by their peers because people said, how can the whole world see at the same time? Well, you and I know now that television and satellite is going to play a major role through the internet, through this medium that I'm using right now, people from all over the world can be watching this study together and they will watch that scene as well. But after three and a half days, the spirit of life, which is from God, enters into them and they are raised up and they ascend to heaven and great fear falls upon, uh, upon all that see it. In chapter 12, you have to understand 11, 12, and 13, they're kind of stacked on each other. There's, they're almost happening at the same time. And you've got to make sure the scene in heaven and the scene on the earth, you're seeing it all. Like John was, was trying to, to uh, make sense of it. In chapter 12, he said there was war in heaven. Again, this is in the middle of the last seven years. He said Michael and his angel. His angels, the archangel, fought against the dragon and his angels. And yet the dragon did not prevail. There was found no more place for him. Michael is going to win. There is going to be a supernatural battle in the heavenlies between angelic beings. Michael and his forces are going to des destroy and defeat the devil and his forces. It should be no upset. Listen. We shouldn't uh, underestimate the power of our enemy, Satan, but neither should we acknowledge him to be greater than what he is. Uh, there are some people that think that he has as much power as God, but that's not true. Satan is a created being. He's a fallen being. He's a defeated being. He's a doomed being. The next time he reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. In the middle of that seven years, there's a war. Satan is cast down. When he does, he knows he has but a short time to live. And so he is going to fill and envelop this coming world ruler. John sees him as the beast. When he wrote the epistles, uh, like 1 John he, and, and the others, he called him Antichrist, which is the name that I think for, for our purposes best allow us to understand what he is going to be like. John said he saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven 
heads and ten horns, crowns upon the horns, and, and the name of blasphemy upon his head. And, and the beast, he said that the dragon gave power to the beast, and the whole world wondered after him, and they worshipped the beast and the dragon that gave him power. And so the world is going to go after him. Could I tell you something? Even in the midst of these present times, in this global pandemic, the first week of May of 2020, the world is crying out for some kind of ruler right now. If there were, was a man on the scene that could come forth with an answer to the epidemic, if they could have an answer to, to all of the shattered economies around the world, the world is ready. If it was the devil himself, I'm convinced humanity is ready to follow after such a person. In the middle of the last seven years, the Antichrist is going to, he, he's going to show his true colors and Israel is going to know that they have been deceived. They're going to accept him as their Messiah. But in the middle of the last seven years, a religious leader called the false prophet here in Revelation 13, working with him, are going to put an image of the beast in the most holy place of the temple that will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. He'll give power to that 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 image so that it can speak. It may be computer driven, technology driven, likely will be. But all those that don't worship that image, he's going to command them to be killed. And then at the end of chapter 13, it said simply that, that uh, he commanded all men, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, that no man might be able to buy or sell unless he had the mark of the beast the name of the beast or the number of his name. We don't know what the, the mark of the beast is going to be, the, the insignia, the emblem. We don't know the, the name of the beast. We know the number, 666. It's one short of seven, three times. A number of man rather than the number of perfection. We don't know his name. I told you in our last session that so many people are disappointed because I'm not able to give them the, uh, the answer of the day to the rapture. And those same people, the other thing they want to know the most is who is the Antichrist. But we don't know who he is. Scripture doesn't tell us. Some think that they pinpoint the geographical location where he's going to come from. But in our global uh, community today, man could be born in one nation, raised in another, and ultimately live in yet another nation if I understand the scripture right, the true bride of Christ, the church, we're not going to know who the Antichrist is. Someone said, is he alive today? Well, if we're close enough to the end that Jesus is going to return very soon for his own, then it's possible the Antichrist is alive, but he won't be revealed until this point. And um, I know there's been a lot of sensationalism about the mark of the beast. But listen, this thing's not going to come in as a religious thing. It's going to be an economic thing. It's going to be the solution to all the problems of, of fraud and identity theft and crime and, and currency. It'll be so simple. The technology is already in place. Why not just have a permanent mark in your right hand or in your forehead? And, and we sometimes think, well, people will be, they'll be making people take this I'm telling you, most of the world is confronted with this option. They'll be standing in line to do it willfully because they're aligning themselves with this false ruler, the Antichrist. So I hasten to tell you in chapter 16, 17, and 18, we're nearing the end of this thing. You get to the seven last vials. The very first one that's poured out in chapter 16. Now remember, we're in the last three and a half years of the age. It's these, these sores, these boils that cover people, but they don't cover humanity in general. It's not like this pandemic that's just, a, you know, infecting everyone. These noisome sores and boils, they are only afflicting the people that have taken the mark. This tells us when you get to that latter part of tribulation, God is turning his wrath specifically against those who are aligning themselves with Satan's false Christ and his kingdom. The second vial is poured out on the sea. It becomes blood. The third vial is poured out on the rivers. They become like blood. The fourth vial is poured out upon the sun. Men are scorched with great heat. But John said, still, 
They did not repent. Think about that. In the midst of obvious judgment, people still are not repenting. You would think even in a global pandemic like this, there would be worldwide repentance going on. There are people repenting. People are coming to Christ in great numbers. But many people, sadly, still will not repent. The fifth vial is poured out and darkness fills the kingdom of this Antichrist. When the sixth vial was poured out, it's poured out on the great river Euphrates. The water is dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And in this chapter, chapter 16, John saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. He said they're spirits of devils working miracles. They're going to speak to generals and captains of armies and tell them to gather together for the last battle of the age. And simply in chapter 16, verse 16, John said he gathered them together into a place which is called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Have you heard about Armageddon? Hollywood's made all kinds of movies about Armageddon and people have written about it in novels and and all kinds of, of imagery that, that even a secular world has embraced. But we better stay with the scripture to understand that Armageddon is going to be where the armies of the earth are going to gather once and for all to defeat Israel. And if this king, if their Messiah does return, as some are talking about, they're going to be ready for him too. Chapter 17 and chapter 18 tell us about two Babylon's one is a mystery babbling. One's a literal babbling. Evidently, they're talking about all the religious systems of the earth becoming kind of a one world religion, but it's going to be destroyed. The economies of this earth, like Babylon, are going to be brought to nothing in a single day, according to chapter 18. And that brings us to chapter 19. And finally, we turn the page and it says, after these things. Some translations say after this. You know why those two words are so wonderful after this? It tells us tribulation is not going to last forever. God's putting a limit on this thing. That's mercy. Even in the midst of judgment there's grace and there is mercy. Do you remember that verse Jesus said except those days be shortened no flesh would be saved but for the elect's sake those days would be shortened. He's not talking about the days having less than 24 hours in them. He's talking about this tribulation period. If, if God were to allow this future world ruler to have 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, like Hitler gobbling up one country after the other on a magnified scale, <coughs> there wouldn't be anybody left. But the Antichrist is going to have his hands full the last three and a half years. God's putting a limit on this thing. And you turn the page to chapter 19 after this, John heard a voice, great numbers, of many voices in heaven. And you know what they were all saying? Hallelujah. And they say it again. Hallelujah. And a third time. Hallelujah. Why? The false church has been judged. She's been put down. She's been destroyed. The smoke of her torment, torments rising up forever. Truth alone is standing. And hallelujah choruses are ringing throughout all of the world. And in verse 7 of chapter 19, John said it's time to rejoice for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. He, he, it's too glorious for him to describe. He doesn't describe a single thing about the marriage supper of the Lamb, but he does say in verse, verse 9, he said, Blessed are they who've been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In verse 7, he said, The wife has made herself ready, and to her was granted she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The wonderful event Christ promised. He himself is going to be there. It's going to be in his honor. He's going to, to honor us, but it's all about him. It's the marriage of the Lamb. And finally, I want to conclude this second session by taking you back to the earth at Armageddon. In verse 11, Revelation 19, we're down to the last days. We're down to the last moments of the tribulation. And John said, he looked and the heavens were open. And behold, a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. 
With righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire. On his head there were many crowns. Who is this king? Well, you know who it is. It's Jesus. Where did we read about all those crowns? At the end of session one, we said the saints around the throne were casting their crowns at his feet. Look at them now. They've all been gathered up. And here comes the king. And all the crowns are upon him. And as he comes back from heaven, he's not alone. It said the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses. Who is that army? Is it angels? No, it's not angels. It's not cherubim and seraphim. It's the church. It's the bride. You say, you can't prove that. I think I can. Verse 14 said, The armies which were in heaven followed and clothed in fine linen, clean and white. I just read in verse 8 that the bride made herself ready and to her was given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Here comes the church. Do you understand the world's going to not be sad when a lot of us are taken out of here. But I've got news for a, 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 a priceless world. We're coming back. Yeah. We're not just going to float around in heaven on, wear wings and play harps forever. We're coming back with the king. Yes. When he comes back. He's not going to fire a shot. He's not going to drop a bomb. Verse 15 said that a sword was going out of his mouth that with it he should smite the nations and he's coming to tread the wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Do you understand right now? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. But there's coming a day, the word, just the word of God going out of his mouth will destroy the armies. Not every person left on the earth will be there that day, just the armies. And it'll be hundreds of thousands of them, but they're going to be destroyed. And in verse 16, John said, on his thigh and on his vesture was a name that is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Have you heard the good news? This is the greatest of all good news. The King is coming. The King is coming. Our Lord is coming back to earth again. Not just appearing in the clouds to take us away. No, that's going to happen, but He's coming back to rule and reign upon the earth. And when he does, the Antichrist and false prophet are going to be judged, cast into the lake of fire. Satan's going to be put in the bottomless pit. King Jesus is going to go into Jerusalem and inaugurate an earthly kingdom. And we belong to Jesus. We're going to have a part with him when he comes. I tell you that it's going to get worse before it gets better. But when it's all said and done, the king is coming back. And when he does, he's going to inaugurate a kingdom of righteousness forever and forever. My brother, my sister, my friend, stay faithful, stay true. It'll be worth it all one day. Thank you for joining us in session two, and I hope you'll be able to join us when we pick up uh, in chapter 20 in the third session. We'll continue by answering the question, what's going to happen now after Jesus comes back to the earth? Courage in the crisis. Amen. Anybody excited? The king is coming. Amen. Amen. He's coming back, church, yes, just like he, he said. Amen. Yes, when his feet left this earth, standing on that mount that day. That's right. He said, I'm coming back. Oh, just like you said. Hallelujah. 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 I hope everyone understands the clarity. The rapture of the church, Jesus will not put his feet on this earth. It's the reason why the many things that we hear being told, and I hope you understand the clarity of that, nothing has to happen before Jesus comes back and raptures his bride away. I have good news. If you're saved, you're not going to be here for tribulation. Thank you, Jesus. I am redeemed by the Lamb of God. And I thank him for that. Yes. Brings me great joy tonight to be able to go home and lay my head down on a pillow knowing that all is well between me and God. I just want to speak to you just a moment. Maybe you're joining us on this webpage or maybe you're in this building and you don't know whether you're ready or not. I want to have a chance if I didn't know. Oh, I don't believe all that stuff. I, you know, it's just heresy. It's just the story of book. 
that has been written. That book that has been written is the infallible word of a true and living God. Amen. Preacher, how are you so convinced that it's real? Because I've seen it unfolded inside the wine press of my heart. I felt it come to life in me. I have seen it and known it to change me. I have had it rescue me. I've had it heal me. I've had it deliver me. And tonight is made me free. Because the Bible said, Whom this book, the spirit of this book, sets free, is free in me. But if you don't know Him, the Bible said, No man comes to the Father. No man comes to the truth. It's not in any other name other than the name of Jesus. And I know there's a large percentage of the world around us today that is declaring it by another name. But I charge you tonight by the authority of the Holy Spirit, there is no other name under heaven nor earth other than Jesus Christ in which a man can be saved. You can be saved tonight. You can know that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that all is well. Preacher, that sounds foreign and strange to me. It is. But I want to remind you that God's Word is true and so. And He said, if a man confess with his mouth and believe in his heart that Jesus Christ is faithful and just to forgive him of his sins. You see, I don't know where you're at tonight, but I do know that if you don't know, then you're not where you need to be. I just want to give you an invitation right now if you're viewing or if you're sitting here in this building and right now, just like that, Jesus could come. You're talking about a drop mic experience. Hoss, I'm leaving this mic behind. Jesus. <laughs> Somebody can catch it and pick it up and do whatever you want to with it. I'm going with Him. But if you don't know you're ready to go with Him tonight by the blood of the Lamb, you're not going. And I don't want to be here to face this tribulation. What Dr. Trammell was explaining to us tonight is that there will be people saved during tribulation. But my friend, the only way that you will be saved, you will lay down your own life. And you can take this for what it's worth. If you can't get up on Sunday morning and wash your face and come to the house of God, how in the world do you expect me to believe you're going to lay down your life for your own salvation? When another man by the name of Jesus Christ laid down his life that you might have life and have it more abundantly and you can't even lay down for a moment the cares of this present life and the desires of this flesh and follow him, but you're going to tell me that you're willing to lay down your life that your life may be redeemed? I don't think you can. If you can, prove it. Give your life to Him now and follow Him. It takes a man to follow Jesus. It takes a true man to have the love of God shut up in your heart that in times like this that you don't hate other people. It's only God. Not one of us in this building are capable of that. It is the love of God. It is unexplainable. But I tell you tonight, by the love and the grace of God and the mercies of God, if you call on Him tonight, He'll save you. Amen. He's already paid the price. You don't have to do anything but accept it. You don't have to do anything but receive it. And I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Maybe you would say right now, Preacher, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to die and go to hell for all of eternity, but I want to live with Jesus and reign with Him. If that's you, would you just repeat after me tonight, Dear Jesus, I confess my sins. I know that I am a sinner, but I believe that you are my Savior. I believe you lived, you died, and you rose again. And I believe tonight you sit at the right hand of the Father. And I confess my sins to you. And I ask you, Lord, into my life and into my heart. I give you the reins of my life. And I invite you to come and be the Lord of my heart. I promise from this day forward, Lord, with your help and the leading of the Holy Spirit, that I will do my very best to serve you all the days of my life. When I fail, I will confess my failure to you and I will repent. In 
Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And just like that, you pray a prayer. You invite Him into your heart and you mean it with every fiber of your being. And then you confess it. You just simply say, I've done it. I believe it. I receive it. Amen. I used to have a little trouble with that. It's amazing how when time goes by, God shows you things. I don't know if y'all have ever heard tell of direct deposit or not. Most of you in this building that get paid, it's on a direct deposit. Yet you'll take a checkbook, you'll take a debit card, and you'll go out to the store, and you'll load your buggy load full, walk up to a cash register, and pay for food and supplies, and you ain't never seen the money. But you just believe it's been put there. But yet you tell me you cannot receive Jesus because you can't see Him and you can't touch Him. Honey, you might can't touch Him, but He can touch you. Amen. Just Hallelujah. receive Him by Hallelujah. faith. Step yes. out of that faith and say, Lord, You are my Savior. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. If you've done that tonight, we just invite you to Share with us tonight. I received Jesus as my Savior. If you're in this room and you've done that tonight, and you just maybe you've been from Him and you're home tonight, or maybe you've never done it before, but you've done it now. Just slip up that hand. All you gotta do is just slip up that hand and say, Hey, that was me, that was me. Jesus saved me. We thank God tonight because that's made available to us. At any time, the Bible said, Whosoever called upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you for joining us tonight. I pray that your spirit man has been fed. I pray that you have been enlightened. I'm sure everyone has questions. We always do. But I, re I revert you back to the Word of God. And let me tell you what it says. Call unto me. And I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. That's what he tells us. I thank Dr. Trammell for uh, his wisdom and knowledge. You do not want to miss next Wednesday night. If you thought it was good tonight, because tonight was the bad stuff, which the church ain't going to have to live through. Somebody say, thank God. Yes. Amen. I believe that. Amen. Why would I need a Savior if I'm going to pay my own way? Jesus said he paid my way. Amen. In Amen. full. Hallelujah. Yes. In full. Thank you. But next Wednesday night, he's going to be talking to us about that thousand years. That millennial night. That time when the devil is bound. That's going to be a glorious time. But you want to come because you want to hear it all because the Bible said after that time for a season, we don't know that season amount, but for a season he'll be loosed and he's going to explain all that to you. You don't want to miss it. Amen. Thank you all for being here. Shiloh family, it's so good to have you in the house tonight. You're just such a blessing. I know there are many as we close out in prayer tonight. There are many that are standing in need of prayer. We want to remember Bruce's mama tonight. And uh, we just believe in God for a miracle. Amen. Amen. A faithful woman of God that has served him for a number of years. And uh, we know that God is right by her side tonight. Pray for this family uh, during this time. It's, as we all know, it's a painful thing when you can't be with your loved one. And uh, let's just pray for, for them. Pray that we got some in the nursing homes that... You know, we're not able to go and visit, and it just breaks our heart. And family members that are having to view their loved one through a window, and it just breaks our heart. But we know a God that's still yes. in control. Hallelujah. Oh, man, He's still in control. Yes. yes. There's some preparation going on on planet Earth, and it's expanding, and it's getting ready. Yes. The foundations of this earth are being shaken. Yes. I pray that you're turning to Jesus. Yes. If we've ever need Jesus, we need Him. This ain't a time to run away from Him. Yes. This is a time to run to Him. Yes. Jesus. Remember these in your prayer. We're going to close out with that prayer tonight. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. If you accept the Lord tonight, just please send us that message tonight on that uh, device that you're looking at. And just say, hey, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen. We want to reach out to you give you some next steps, some next things you need to be doing. 
Amen. We love you and we appreciate you and we're proud of you tonight for the decision that you might have made. We want to remember these that are hurting and suffering right here that are part of our church family tonight. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your nearness. You're near unto us tonight. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for your faithfulness to us. Even when things don't make sense. Even when we feel converted and we feel in great pain. When our loved ones are suffering and going through things that we're limited and cannot do or be with them. It feels helpless. But I know a God tonight is able to step right into any room. He is not limited by time, space, nor matter. He's able to walk right beside of that hospital bed tonight. Reach over and lay the palm of His hand on their head and speak healing over their body. Hallelujah. God, I just thank You, Lord, tonight because You're able to comfort families that are going through stressful situations. And, and I ask You, Lord, to touch them. You just feel that urgency right now. Uh, Tammy, Ricky, Gary, I want you guys to move right there. Just put your hands on them. Jonathan, I want you to move right there behind this family right here. Jack, I want you to move right here behind Brenda. 